Hello there. Let's continue on with the tutorials on what a representation is in quantum mechanics. We finished the last lesson talking about having simultaneous eigenstates between commuting operators. But I'd like to talk to you about what it means for measurement. In other words, the measurement of an observable such as position or momentum or energy if the operators associated with those commute. So remember that eigenstates of a quantum operator can be used as a basis or as a representation for other quantum states if the operators commute. So, if we're talking about position, excuse me, of, of uh, momentum and energy, well then we would need the momentum and energy operators to commute. So let's recall what happens if we apply the energy operator, which is the Hamiltonian, on a generic or arbitrary quantum state, let's call it psi. Well, what happens is the generic quantum state must decide what energy it has. It must collapse or project into the associated energy eigenstate. And that will give us the energy eigenvalue equation. And if we measure the momentum of the same state, the same process happens and it will collapse or project into an eigenstate of the momentum operator. Now, I leave it as a reasonably simple exercise for you to show that the Hamiltonian and momentum operators commute. And we do that using this process here. So we'll find out that the commutator is zero and that the operators commute. And we're going to explore what this means for measurement, the measurement of momentum and of energy of the system psi. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we're going to measure the energy eigenvalue of the state psi. And doing so is very straightforward. We've already done it. We're going to apply the energy operator, the Hamiltonian, to our arbitrary quantum state. This is going to collapse the quantum state or get it to project into or onto an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So we'll measure the energy of the system. The system will decide what energy it's in by getting into an eigenstate associated with that particular energy and it'll be in an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian or the energy operator. So if you understand that so far, you're doing very well. Now, we know that quantum operators must be Hermitian. So the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. It has real eigenvalues. But as a consequence, we also get the really neat fact that the eigenstates of Hermitian operators are able to span your space or Hilbert space. They're able to act as a basis or as a representation for other states in the space. Now, since the Hamiltonian and the momentum operators commute, that means that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the energy eigenstates, span the space and it can also describe the momentum eigenstates. And that's done by taking a linear combination of the energy eigenstates. In a way, there is no distinct distinction between the momentum eigenstates and the energy eigenstates because you can always get a momentum eigenstate by taking linear combinations of the energy eigenstates. Now the question is, what does this mean for a subsequent application of the momentum operator? So you've measured the system's energy and now you want to know its momentum. And the answer is that applying the momentum operator won't cause the system to collapse again because it's already in an eigenstate of the momentum operator because the eigenstates of the momentum operator are linear combinations of eigenstates of the energy operator but when we applied the energy operator, the system collapsed into an eigenstate of the energy operator. So in short, by doing so, we're both simultaneously in an eigenstate of the, of the energy operator and of the momentum operator. So that when we apply the momentum operator onto our eigenstate, the E sub n, we'll simply get out the associated momentum eigenvalue. We'll get the momentum of the system and we've already gotten the energy of the system using a similar process. So there's a lot of roundabout logic but I, I really hope that you, you followed me on this one. So 
we know that if our quantum operators commute, then the order of their application is important. So take, for example, the operators, the arbitrary operators A and B, applying them on the generic or arbitrary quantum state psi. We know that if the commutator is zero, then the operators commute, and if it's non-zero, they don't commute. So what I'd like to do is consider two commuting operators, A and B arbitrary operators that commute, similar to our energy and momentum operators we discussed a moment ago. We know that if the operators commute, the order of their application onto a quantum state vector isn't important. And what I haven't said so far is that if the operators commute, they share non-degenerate eigenstates. The degenerate eigenstates aren't shared, or it's a bit more complex, and I don't want to go there for the moment. So we say, if operators commute, they share non-degenerate eigenstates. In other words, they have essentially common eigenstates. This we've seen so far. I'd like to show you why that's the case. So let's consider the eigenvalue equation associated with the operator A. We know that applying the operator A onto a generic or arbitrary quantum state will cause the system to collapse into an eigenstate of that operator, giving us this eigenvalue equation. Now, we know that if the operators A and B commute, which we're saying is the case, then the order of their application isn't important. So what I'm going to do now is take the operator B and apply it to the left-hand side of both sides of this eigenvalue equation. And that's what we have here. But since the order of their application, in other words, B then A, isn't, isn't uh, important, then we can swap it and have A then B. In fact, my language there isn't quite correct. In this case here, the operator A is being applied first and then B. In this case, the operator B is being applied first and then A. So to say that again, here we have A being applied first and then B. We know that the operators commute, hence the order of their application isn't important, hence we can swap their order. And what we're left with then is this eigenvalue equation, which I've rewritten in the bottom center of your screen. And if you look closely, we can group this section, the operator B acting on the quantum state vector A. And if you look again on the outside, we'll see we have simply another eigenvalue equation. We have an operator, capital A, acting on some quantum state vector, and it gives us back the same quantum state vector with a multiplicative constant. In other words, we have an eigenvalue equation in the operator A. So think about it. We started by getting an arbitrary quantum state and measuring the value associated with the observable A. We got the associated eigenvalue, we measured that particular observable, and then we said, well, what happens if we apply another operator, B? And we saw that because the operators commute, the order of their application didn't matter, and that the quantum state vector made by operating B onto the quantum state, quantum state vector A is an eigenvalue of the operator A. Excuse me, is an eigenstate of the operator A. And this means that the operator B acting on A is an eigenstate of the operator A with the same eigenvalue. That means that the operator B acting on the quantum state A must be a multiple of the quantum state A. And let's just call its multiple another scalar, let's call it B. And you'll see that we have a very similar eigenvalue equation. We started with the operator A acting on the quantum state vector capital A and giving us small a as the eigenvalue. And subsequently we applied the operator B and we found that the operator B acting on the quantum state vector A gives us back another scalar, small b, and the same quantum state vector A. And this only happens because our two operators commute. And because the two operators commute, the quantum state vector capital A is an eigenstate both of operator A and B. In other words, 
these operators share common eigenstates, or we can say that the non-degenerate eigenstates of A are also eigenstates of B. And that's a fairly big jump we've made there, in terms of the logic so far. Now, at the risk of confusing you, I'd just like to show our previous language in action. What we've seen here is that acting with the operator B on a quantum state vector A will give us back the same quantum state vector and an eigenvalue. And that's what we have here. But generically, we know that if we act on an arbitrary quantum state vector using the operator B, that quantum state vector is going to collapse into an eigenstate of the operator B, giving us the same eigenvalue. The point here is that the eigenstates B can be made up of a linear combination of the eigenstates A. And that's why this equation here, this expression here, holds true. So to recap, we recall that measurement of an observable associated with the operator, excuse me, capital A, projects the arbitrary quantum state vector onto an eigenstate of the operator A. And this is an expression we've seen on numerous occasions at this point. If you subsequently try and measure an observable associated with the operator B, that operator B is also going to project the input state, which in this case is now going to be here, onto an eigenstate of the operator B. Mathematically, this is expressed here. We can see that since the operators A and B commute, the states ket A and ket B are essentially the same. They only differ by essentially a linear combination. We can say that eigenstates of A are also eigenstates of the operator B. So we no longer need to distinguish between them by using the kets B, because they are simply a linear combination of the kets A. So you know that measurement with the operator B doesn't change the system, and we can know both observables simultaneously. So that's all I've got to say for this particular video segment. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Visit universityphysicstutorials.com.